Good morning. Came and took them away Everything that I was is buried in the ground A second chance that you have given to me Everything I am is in your hands Separate us from this Father's love My future And for the rest of my days Everything I am Is in your hands Greater Tell the king of lies, there's nothing more to say. Our sins nailed to the cross, and there's no one in the grave. Tell the king of lies, there's nothing more to say. Our sins nailed to the cross, and there's no one in the grave. We're gonna shout it from the rooftops. 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 Shout it from the rooftop. We're gonna 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 shout it from the rooftop
this morning. Thank Him this morning for what He's done in your life. Thank Him this morning for the breath that you have. God, we bless you this morning. God, we know that without you we would be nothing. God, we know, God, God, that because of you, God, we have life and life abundantly, God. Because of you, God, we have hope. Because of you, God, we have salvation, Jesus. God, we thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Church, let's declare it this morning. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just as I am, I come. Just as I am, I come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, what a blessing. Come on, sing it out. Thank you, Jesus. Just as I am, I come.
bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Jesus, we thank you. God, we thank you this morning. Thank you, God, for everything you've done for us, God. And God, the health, the provision, the jobs. God, everything, Lord God. God, we just stand amazed this morning that you are so intimately concerned with our lives. Every aspect, every detail. And God, so this morning, God, we just return praise back to you, God, with thankful hearts. God, thank you seems so insufficient for everything that you've done, God, but that's all we can express is thanks, God. So you see our hearts through this worship time, God, you see our hearts. And God, with grateful hearts, we worship you, God, we thank you. God, if you never blessed us again with anything else, God, salvation was enough, and we thank you for that most importantly. God, we thank you for this time of worship that we've had. God, just to focus on you, God, to make you the priority of our day. Lord, I ask that as we continue with our service, God, you would continue to let your presence, God, just increase in this room. God, you'd open up our hearts and our minds. God, to hear your word. God, that we wouldn't just hear it, God, but it would be applied to good hearts, God, and good soil, Lord God, that it would reap a harvest, God, in our lives and the lives of others that we connect with. Uh, I got sick last week, and thank goodness, thank God that I had a man that when I said, can you handle the service Sunday, he said, no problem whatsoever, and I wasn't feeling very good, but Shannon did FaceTime it and set the iPad on the chair, and so I got to watch the entire service, and, and uh, man, I was just so thankful that Pastor Chris was able to come in and do what he was going to do. But last week, I was going to talk to you about that ministry test that I sent home with each and every one of us. And how many had the opportunity to take that test? Some of you, several of you took the test. That test is really just its kind of a tool that we use to let you see different areas that you are good at in, 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 in your ministry. There's a lot of times people will come in to a church wanting to get involved in a ministry, want to do something, and this is what they tell me. I can't speak and I can't sing, so I have no place that I can function. I'm too shy. I can't get in front of people. I can't talk in front of a crowd, so I can't do nothing for God. Well, when you take that test and you begin to look at all the different things that you could do, and then we talked about what the Word of God said, the gifts are that God gives us. Each and every one of us, we all have a talent that God has given you that nobody else possesses. Derek has something that Derek can do that only Derek can do that nobody else in this church can do. And what Derek brings into this congregation is, is so valuable. And I just picked on you because you were sitting there smiling at me, so that's what you get. And so, But what Derek brings in, nobody else can do it. That's what makes Derek, his personality, his talent, his skills, that was, that's what makes him so valuable to the, to the church and to what we're trying to do. Here in the next few weeks, and uh, we're going to be looking at some new ministries that we're going to take on, looking at some home missions and some different aspects of some really some hands-on stuff that we need to do. And as we begin to launch these, I'm wanting you to look at those, those tests that you took, things that you were good at. And as I begin to introduce these things, this is some things that literally you can look at and you go, that's my heart. I love working with kids. I don't want to teach them. I don't want to babysit them, but I want to help kids. That's an area that I can get involved in. Uh, one of my greatest desires in, in a ministry that I want to get really going in our church is really something for single moms that, that are raising families. That, that My heart is for a single mom that's raising families. And, and there's some things that I would really like to do of helping some ladies out in this area. And so we're going to be introducing some ministries, looking at some new things that they're actually hands-on. And those tests that you took are going to help kind of show you where you can fit in and how you can be involved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I was going to use it in my sermon last week, so I didn't get to preach, so I just threw it in real fast, and now we're going to move on. Today I want to start in a brand new series, and it's called Suit Up. And uh, this series is going to kind of be a long series. We're going to take a little bitty break for Father's Day, and then we'll, we'll continue it. But as we dive into this, we're going to take 
every aspect of the armor of God. And we're going to look every Sunday at a different aspect of the armor. We're going to kind of dissect it, tear, tear it apart, and we're going to look exactly what the armor of God is about, why we need to put it on, and, and what, what the armor does for each and every one of us in our lives. So as we start this morning, I'm going to take you to uh, Ephesians 6, chapter 10, starting in chapter 10. And as we start there, Chris, I'm going to have you do me a quick favor. Go give me just a tad, a floor monitor. When I have floor monitor, I don't scream near as loud, okay? So we're going to get just a, we've got a little bit of a problem with our sound system, but if you can, if you can bear with us, we'll get it going. I'm going to start in Ephesians chapter 10, uh, 6, verse 10, and I'm going to read, it's going to be a little bit different from you, because as I'm starting off, I want to read this from the, from the God's Word translation, because I think it breaks it down just a little bit different in the terminology that I wanted to read, so it's not going to be exactly what, what you're used to hearing, but it says this, put on the full armor of God that God supplies. Finally, receive the power from the Lord and from his mighty strength. Put on the full armor of God that God supplies. In this way, you can take a stand against the devil's strategies. This is not wrestling match against human opponents. We are, not, we are wrestling with rulers, authorities, the powers who go govern this world of darkness and spiritual forces that control evil in the heavenly realm. For this reason, take up all the armor that God supplies. Then you will be able to take a stand during these evil days. Once you have overcome all obstacles, you will be able to stand your ground. That's basically what we're going to be talking about today in those verses. But it continues, and this is going to be the rest of the series. So then... Take your stand. Fasten truth around your waist like a belt. Put on God's approval as your breastplate. Put on the shoes so that you are ready to spread the good news that gives peace. And in addition to these, take the Christian faith as your shield. With it, you can put out the flaming arrows of the evil one. Also, take the helmet of uh, the, the salvation as your helmet and God's word as the sword that the Spirit supplies. Today I want to talk to you, as you put a title on this and you want to write this down, I want to talk to you, Life at War. Have you noticed, I'm going to come down and talk to you for just a little bit down here, but have you noticed maybe in the last 10 years how drastically morals have changed? It is the most amazing thing for me to remember the very first time I ever saw a black and white TV. It is an amazing thing for me to remember the very first time I ever heard a cuss word on TV. It is amazing to me that uh, I remember the very first, anybody remember the Brady's Bunch? They put two couples in the same bed and it was like, whoo, and all they did was sit there and talk, you know, and it was like, oh my goodness, they put them in the same bed. Now you turn the TV on, and it is free game of anything and everything all the time, and there's no censor. There's no filter. We look at where our world is going, and, you know, there's no phrase that says our world's going to hell in a handbasket. may not be too far off, ba uh, off base, but we look at a world that, that our morals are literally being destroyed, and I want to say it's from the outside in. The enemy is so good at what he does, at getting his foot in the front door of our lives. And what a better place to destroy our morals than our, in our living room. Isn't that right? The enemy's very good at what he does. Paul describes something that we need to put on every day in our lives. Something that we need to wear constantly. And he refers to it as the armor of God. Now, as you do some study, and Paul is in a, Paul is in a house arrest, and he's probably chained to a prison guard. He's, he, can't, he can't get up. He can't leave. But as he's looking at the Romans, I believe that God begins to give him a revelation. 
And as he's looking at these Roman guards that's guarding him, God begins to speak and said, you know, he said that belt that he's got, it is like the belt of truth. It's, it's something that you need to gird around your waist. It's, a, it's the truth of who God is. And, and as Paul's looking at this Roman guard, I believe that God begins to reveal and he begins to write down uh, in, in the word of God exactly the different pieces of the armor that, the, that these guards are wearing. And, and this is one of the most incredible studies that you'll ever do when you really dissect and tear apart every piece of the armor. Because once you begin to look at, at what each thing does, it is incredible what God is telling us through his word that we've got to do to each and every one of our lives. Paul begins to describe something, and I believe, believe the reason why he's describing it is because Paul realizes that for the majority of people, and you correct me if you think I'm wrong, or you correct me if you think the Apostle Paul is wrong. But I believe Paul is correct when he's doing this teaching that the majority of people are completely unaware of the enemy's schemes. Because I believe what happens is we get so caught up with life. How many's got caught up with life? How many's got too much stress? in their life, and, and it's easy to get caught up in stress. How many has got too much grief or too much heartache or not enough money at the end of the week? And there's just things that happen that gets our attention, our undivided attention, and a lot of times what happens is because of the worry, because of the stress, because of the junk and the funk and just this the stuff of life, we have a tendency to put God on the back burner of our life. And to think everything else is so much more important. Now, we know that for a fact that God needs to be priority. And, and, and if you sit down and talk to you, each and every one of us could say that. Yes, God has to be the priority. But how often do we put the other things a priority and all of a sudden anxiety overrides God? I didn't know how to do this today, and I wanted to do this, and I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I'm not going to do it the way I wanted to do it, but I'm going to do it maybe the way you're going to understand it. But if I, could, if I could imagine, if you could imagine with me God, and talking about how big God is, how can you describe how big God is? <laughs> so as I was trying to figure out how to describe God, I went, I can't do this exactly how I want to do it, but I wanted to get like a pencil, a marker, or something, and draw a whole picture around the whole back wall of this room and say, this is how big my God is. This is God, okay? This is how big God is. God is big. God is huge. God is overwhelming. God cannot be described. He cannot be explained. He is bigger than big. He's big. He's God. He's big. And so I wanted to describe as we're diving into this and just talking about who God is that you've got to understand, you've got to realize that in the middle of your stress, in the middle of your stuff, in the middle of your relationship issues, in the middle of your kids goofing up, in the middle of whatever it may be, a sickness, a loss of a job, whatever it is, God's bigger than the stuff we go through. God's big. Somebody say it. God's big. Big. Then I wanted to try to describe to you how big our enemy is. That little dot represents in the vastness of who my God is. That little dot right there represents the enemy. And we have a tendency to believe the lies of something that big instead of the reality of a God who is this big. And the Apostle Paul, he understands this. He's working in his church, been working with his church in Ephesus, and it's the Ephesians church, and when you write, write the book of Ephesians, it's, it's where he's been ministering. It's the people that he's talking to. And he's looking at church people, and he's looking at society, and he's basically saying, you don't get it. You don't get it. And you know why you don't get it? Because we don't understand the enemy. Matter of fact, it's not that we don't understand the enemy. We don't know our enemy. 
anytime you go into military strategies, there is in-depth study of the enemy. You just don't walk in and fight somebody and not knowing what their strategies are. But what happens so many times for us as Christians, we get saved and we're very poor at discipling people and we turn them loose into the public and we send them out to fight a battle naked and afraid. And so we don't know the enemy. We don't know who the enemy is. And what you've got to realize today, this is life at war. Life at war. Whenever you accept Jesus Christ into your life, and I hope that's everybody in this place, whenever you accept Jesus Christ into your life, whenever you become a new follower, a new Christian, a new believer, someone that's seeking God, whenever you do this, the moment you do that, you develop three brand new enemies in your life. Before you're a Christian, guess what? The enemy really doesn't care about your influence. Before you're a Christian, you can go party, you can do, you can drag people into the mud, you can do whatever you want to do, and the enemy will look at you literally and say, yeah, good, go do it, go, go take care of it. But the moment you say yes to salvation, the moment you say yes to God, the radar on the screen of the enemy screen goes, and all of a sudden, the radar is pointed at you because the enemy is going, somebody new, there's a new blip on the screen of salvation. Somebody new has now come into the family of God. Somebody new has made a decision, and now you're targeted. Doesn't sound fair, does it? Hell, well, welcome to life. <laughs> welcome to life. But the moment you accept Jesus Christ in your life, you now find that there's three brand new enemies. Now, I'm going to throw something up on the screen here because I want you to understand and kind of see this for a little bit, and we're not going to spend a lot of time here. But the first enemy that we have uh, that I want to talk about is this first enemy is the world, the world. It is literally the enemy of the world that sneaks into our lives, and it really does, does a lot of things in our lives. It comes to kill, steal, and to destroy but it is the enemy of the world. And, and I'm going to tell you, Satan attacks God's program. And the program is really the program of the church. It is the program of our government. But Satan loves to attack our programs. And, and, and in doing so, he wants to destroy and deceive us. Let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. We're talking about that as the world, uh, there's several things that, that he attacks. There's and, and, and I try to use all the scripture that you can see that ties this, this together. But he attacks God's programs through false prophecies and false religions and false ministers. He does this through false doctrine and false disciples. He does this through false morals. And, man, we can see that in the decline of what is on our, our TVs and our movie theaters, that there are no morals. It is He does this through directing governments. And this is what we see happen to the Congolese people that were in Africa. There were governments that, that began to faction and literally destroying and uh, deceiving men. How many of you know men are deceived? Man, I was watching TV the other day, and they had kids in their classroom stand and pledge allegiance to the flag. Well, when they do that, how many just say the words with it? And they left out one nation under God, and I got ticked off. Deceiving men. How dare you take God out of my government? How dare you come in and deceive men to think that God's not important anymore? But it's deceiving men, and he does it through destroying life. Life doesn't matter. And, and it's the world system that we attack. The second thing is this. Not only does the world now become our enemy, but guess what? So does our flesh. Our flesh becomes an enemy. <laughs> My flesh is an enemy of God because this is what I want to satisfy daily. And the Word of God tells me I have to lay this on the altar daily. But I told you the problem with the living sacrifice is it has a tendency to get up and walk off the altar, and that's the problem with our flesh. I mean, let me show you what happens with our flesh. This is what happens with our flesh. Satan attacks God's people. Not only does he attack the programs of our life, but he also attacks the people uh, that's in this world through what? Persecuting the saints, 
preventing service, a promoting division. Isn't that awesome? He loves to divide churches. You know, we should be in the we should be in the job of multiplying churches, but the enemy loves to come in with something stupid and divide churches. If he can keep us small, he can keep us right where he wants us. Planning doubt. And he also does this, the next screen, he also does this through through provoking sin in people's lives. These are the strategies. These are the, the things of the enemy, but he does this through anger. How many angry people have you seen in the streets of, uh, I just lost the name of the city. Thank you very much. How many angry people have you seen in Baltimore? They don't even know why they're angry, but I'm going to tell you, it is an enemy that gets his foot in the foothold of a life, a people, a system, a situation, a government, however he can get his foot in to promote anger, to promote pride, worry, self-reliance, uh, discouragement, worldness, lying, immorality. He is producing in our, in our society secret cults and sex, anything he can to destroy not only the people of God but the programs of God. Well, who is the enemy that you're attacking. Well, let's look at one more thing. The third thing is the world. It's the flesh. But also there's an enemy, and he is called the devil. The devil is your new enemy once you say, I want to follow Jesus Christ. Now it is life at war. Now it is spiritual warfare. Now all the guns are out, and he's coming after you. And so this is the reason why we've got to put on the full armor. And to understand who the devil is, let's just look at Satan's name and how Satan's name reveals his, his uh, tactics and how he, he reveals his, his, uh, his trickery. But Satan is the adversary. He is literally the one that comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. And that's the only thing that is in his mind is to wipe out God's programs and to wipe out God's people. He is the devil. He is what? He is the slanderer. If he can slander your good name and keep you under, he will do it at any cost. Lucifer was the son of the morning star. That is who he was. We'll look at some of that here in just a moment, what that means. Beelzebub, Beel, uh, the evil one, the tempter, prince of the world, the accuser of the brethren. These are just a few of the things when you begin to look at who the enemy is that you have got to understand. Now, as we dive into this and we get to looking at everything, I wanted today to be an introductory of spiritual warfare so we could understand why we're putting on the armor. See, this is what you've got to realize. We are in battle, and it is an invisible spiritual battle. There is a cosmic conflict that is taking place all the way around us that has, and you've got to understand this when you begin to talk about spiritual battles, that has eternal implications. They're eternal. They're forever. Whatever you're going through today, you've got to understand this ends and eternity begins. The enemy wants you to get so wrapped up in your anger. The enemy wants you to get so wrapped up in an addiction. The enemy wants you to get so lost in a relationship problem that you are so stressed out of your gourd that you're more screwed up than a termite and a yo-yo. The enemy wants you to keep you upside down because he wants you to forget that there's an eternal principle at stake here and he doesn't want you to side up with God. He doesn't want you to enjoy what God's got for you. His greatest plan and he's on mission, is to destroy God's people and to discredit the cause of Christ. That's what he wants to do. He wants to destroy all that is good, and he wants to destroy all that is God-ordained. We've got to understand who our enemy is, and it's talked about in Ezekiel 28, that when Satan was created, it's important to know, God was never created. God is bigger than what you can ever imagine. And God created Lucifer. He is a created being. But when he was created, he was created with more power. He was created with more intelligence. He was created with more beauty than anyone or anything in all of the universe except for God. He was what you call second to one. He was number two. 
And it is amazing that when God creates, he, re- he, he creates us in his likeness that gives us the ability to choose. See, God never wants to force love on anyone because force love is not love at all. And in that ability to choose, the sun of the morning star, the most beautiful, the most brilliant, the most intelligent, you realize that Lucifer, Satan, the devil, our adversary, do you know what his job was in heaven? He was over worship. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Is that why he wants to, to cause, cause so much conflict in the worship services that we have in our church? He was over worship. And this little seed of something snuck into his life because of a choice, and it was called pride. And pride snuck in, and pride says, oh, but I want to be like God. I want to be great like him. And pride pride caused a division in heaven, and this created being that God created that is intelligent, this created being that God created that is powerful, influenced one-third of heaven's angels. One-third. Can I pause right there? You think you're strong enough to do it here on earth when people in heaven with God couldn't even do it there? It's the reason why when Jesus, we're going to kind of change channels for just a second. So when Jesus was leaving, he said, I'm going to leave but I'm sending someone here that's going to impact your life and through the work of the Holy Spirit in you, you're going to do so much more than what you could ever do with me here with you. So I'm leaving and I'm leaving you my Holy Spirit. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. That same power that raised Christ Jesus out of the dead, now it dwells in you. We have to have the power of the Holy Spirit moving in our lives. We've got to have that Pentecostal fire burning within us. We've got to have that, that spirit walking with us, guiding us, directing us. Satan stepped into heaven. And he convinced one-third of the angels to turn their back on God. So God kicked them out. He sent them down. And now he, it talks about he is the ruler of this earth, of this place. There's a place that's been designed for him. Now, this is what I know about people. Sometimes we don't give the enemy enough credit. We've got to understand there is an enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But sometimes I believe we give the enemy too much credit. And we are so spiritually minded that we are no worldly good at all. And I believe there is a balance that takes place where we have got to put Satan in his place. And we've got to understand, greater is my God. You ain't Jack Diddley when it comes to my Jesus. You don't know nothing. You can't do nothing that the name of Jesus can't, can't fix. But we've got to keep it balanced. On the other side, we've got to know this. There is an enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. In the middle of our anger, in the middle of our problems, in the middle of all the things that we go through, we've got to understand there is an enemy that's coming after us. It is spiritual warfare. It is life at war. But this is what we've got to understand. Satan's defeated. Come on, somebody. Satan is defeated. He was defeated the moment my Jesus got out of the grave and breathed a new breath. It is over in the name of Jesus. He conquered death, hell, and the grave, and every battle that we will ever go through is covered by the blood of Jesus. So why do we live like we're not? The Apostle Paul says this, put on the full armor of God. Why? Why do we put on the full armor? Well, it goes on. So that you can take your stand. Pastor Chris talked to us week about the dance that took place with uh, Furry Weather. What was his name? <laughs> and Pac-Man. It, it, I, I didn't see anybody take a stand. I saw this all day long. It's time when we've got to take a stand. We're taking a stand. And the Apostle Paul said, put on that full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against what? The devil's schemes. 
that you can take your stand. Why? Because there's an enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. For our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but we make it against people, don't we? Man, I'm so ticked off at that person, I can't even think straight. And the enemy's going, that's all I needed. If I could just plant a seed and get you in there, get you ticked off, then everything's all good. But it says our struggle's not against flesh and blood. It's, it's against rulers. It's against uh, authorities, against powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul is describing to us a spiritual warfare that is real, a spiritual warfare that is is really the hierarchy of demonic forces. And this is what I believe. As he begins to list these different things, I think he is listing, it's almost like there's a sergeant or there's a, uh, there's a captain or there's a private or there's a lieutenant, whatever. I believe also Paul is describing the different levels of authority of the demonic forces that are in charge of tearing down our country tearing down our society, tearing down structures, tearing out families, tearing down churches, whatever he can do to sneak in and do it. Did anybody see the knucklehead on the news the other day that caught the cotton mouth snake? It's the, mo the water mosican, and he thought it was cool to catch these poisonous snakes, and then he would kiss them. Yeah, it was all over Facebook. Did anybody see all that? Oh, I wish I'd had the pictures on the screen because you'd have loved it. But he'd catch these cottonmouth snakes, and then he'd play with them. He'd, they'd, they'd turn into his pets. And he's like, I love my little cottonmouth. I love my little water mosican. And his little girlfriend was over there, and he's like, oh, I'll just show her how brave I am. I'm such a man, and I can kiss this snake on top of the head. And he would kiss these snakes, and he'd Facebook these pictures and everything. And the other day, this knucklehead caught a cottonhead. And he went to, yeah, that cotton head, cotton headed Nindy Muggin. He caught that <laughs> cotton mouth and he took that snake up to kiss it. And when it did, he coiled out of his hand and bit him on the face. This guy had a nice looking face. It was slender, it was nice looking. After, man, I tell you what, you talk about U G L Y, you ain't got no alibi, you ugly. That snake bit him on the face, and that was about 50 shades of ugly. And as I read that story and looked at that, I thought, we're always playing with death. We're always playing with the enemy. We're always thinking, oh, I can get close to it. I can get so close that I can kiss this sin, this problem, this thing, but I'm strong enough to overcome it until that one time the enemy catches you like he's never caught you before, and all of a sudden you swell up with things that you didn't know that you could have in your system, and it brings a devastation, and it brings a rot, and it brings a death into your life. And I thought, how often do we do the exact same thing? 1 Peter 5.8 says this. Be alert and sober, mind. Your enemy, the devil, what does he do? He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, not just take down. He wants to devour you. Chip Ingram wrote this, and I pulled this off the Internet this week, but Chip Ingram wrote this. Satan's plan is to deceive us, tempt us, and to cause hardened hearts, break marriages, split churches, and bring about depression. And he'll do it gradually by getting an unnoticeable foothold in our lives. How's he do it? By triggering relational conflicts, weighing us down with fear, and weighing us down with anxiety, and tempting us with escape mechanisms such as drugs and alcohol, and we cannot ignore any more Satan's schemes and evil tactics. And when I read what Chip Ingram wrote, I thought, that is so true. That's so true. But what we've got to understand in spiritual warfare, understanding that this life is at war, we've got to understand, guys, we're not fighting for victory. And I think that's a lot of our, our, our problems. We're always fighting for victory. We're always fighting for victory. We're not fighting for victory. Victory's already be, been won. We're fighting for the victory that's already been won. We're fighting from victory, not for victory. The battle was won on the cross, cross, and God has told us through His Word, anything that you go through, 
Jesus has already done it. Anything that you're going to face, Jesus had the exact temptation. He conquered. He overcome. He went to the cross. He allowed himself to be nailed on the cross. He took every sin, every hurt, every relationship problem. He took it upon himself. He went to the grave, and Satan went, oh, I got you now. And three days later, God breathed a new breath through the breath of the Holy Spirit. And to him, Jesus Christ got up. Bam! And victory is ours. We don't have to fight for victory anymore. We fight from the victory of the cross of Jesus Christ. See, this is what I know. If I could bring Pastor Chris up here. I'm not going to bring you up. But if I could bring Pastor Chris up here today and put a blindfold on him, and say, Pastor Chris, we're going to put you in a helicopter. We're going to take you somewhere, and you don't have a clue where you're going, and we're going to drop you off, and you get to survive. This Boy Scout wouldn't do it. And when Chris gets off the helicopter, and he's got his Converse tennis shoes on and his short sleeve shirt on, and he takes the bandana or the hood off of his eyes and he's standing in Afghanistan in the middle of a firefight how long do you think PC would survive in his Converse tennis shoes and his t-shirt in the middle of a firefight in Afghanistan in a blood battle and that's what we do we walk out our front doors blindfolded naked and afraid And we walk into a battlefield thinking that we're going to be okay. And the enemy's going, please think that way. Please walk into the battle stupid, naked, and afraid. Please walk into that place because I am a roaring lion. And I am seeking who I can tear apart, who I can devour, who I can take down. And so many times in our lives, we enter into this thing called war. Naked and afraid. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says this. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his what? Design. He's got a design. He's got a scheme. He's got a trickery. He's got a tack. Something that he wants to do to take you down. Real quick, I'm going to take you to Acts chapter 19. And in Acts chapter 19, I'm going to look at something uh, real quick, and as you're turning there, I want to discuss some things, and we'll come right back there, Ch- Acts chapter 19. But when the Apostle Paul was writing Ephesians, he was working with the churches of Ephesians, the first three chapters are about doctrine and deep truth of salvation, really. That next part that he talks about is really how to apply or live out that truth of salvation, really in our everyday lives. This is what you need to do in your in your in your marriage is what you need to do in your church is what you need to do in your job. This is how you walk out that doctrine of salvation in your life. And then he gets to chapter 6 of Ephesians. In chapter 6 of Ephesians, he has this climatic moment that he says, Finally, <laughs> after I've talked about salvation and doctrine, after I've talked about how to walk it out, finally, I need to get to this important part. Put on the full armor of God. You've got to do this. It is the climactic moment of this whole thing. And he says, this is what's important. This is how you walk it out. This is how you implement it into your family, your church, your relationship. This is what you've got to do. And I want you to write this down. Our hope is in Christ alone. First thing, our hope, it is in Christ alone. That is it. It is in Christ alone. We can't do this on our own. We've got to have the strength of Jesus Christ working in our lives. See, we've got we to remember Satan's a defeated foe. But remember this, just because he's defeated does not mean that he has stopped. While he is destined for destruction, he is intent on throwing every Christian off track and throwing every Christian under the bus, under the bus and ultimately destroying every Christian. He wants you to fail. He does not want you to succeed. He wants your reputation destroyed. Why? Bottom line, he hates God. And God kicked him out of heaven. And he's mad. He's a ticked off little enemy. And now anybody he can take with him, anybody he can turn against God, God's program, God's people, and God's plan, anybody he can take with him, that's what he does. And that's why we call this life 
at war. At war. Second one is this. Our hope is in Christ alone. You've got to understand that our hope is in Christ alone. It's the second one. It'll, it'll come up on the screen here in a minute, I think. Maybe it won't. Maybe it will. Our hope is in Christ alone. Uh, it's the second thing. Satan, uh, Satan is our, oh, you do have it. Satan's our enemy. Thank you very much. I'm with you. I love you. You're good. You're great. You're awesome. You do a good job. I'll leave you alone. Let you do your job. Our enemy is Satan, and our hope is in Christ alone, but our enemy is Satan. And Satan's going to do anything and everything he can to destroy. So we've got to understand it's not people. It's not plans. Our enemy truly is the enemy of a, uh, an enemy that comes to destroy our lives. That's the enemy, is the enemy that comes to destroy, to, to devastate, to bring, to bring destruction. See, have you ever seen a wagon tra- a trail? It's got two ruts. I mean, we're probably going to see a lot of that with mud roads that we've had with all this rain, but there's two ditches. I believe that we've got to avoid the two ditches in our life, and, and the two ditches are this, underthinking the opponent and overthinking the opponent. There's a, there's a balance that takes place. And the Word of God says you can't underthink your opponent, but don't under, underthink your opponent because there's a God that's greater than your opponent. And he can, he can do whatever he wants to do. But you read that scripture, the word stand. We're going to get to Acts 19, and we're going to close with that. The word stand says this. It, it means this. It is a military sense that says this. It has the ideal of holding a critical con- a, a, a position while under attack. And the Apostle Paul says, I need you to stand, and I need you to hold this critical position while you're under attack. Why? Because there's schemes. Schemes is from the word methodology, which means method, cunning arts, deceit, crafty, or, or trickery, or craftiness. And so there's an enemy that's got all kinds of tricks to throw us down. I want to take you to Acts 19, and I'm going to close with this. And in Acts 19, there's a story of what we're going to call the ordinary or the extraordinary versus the ordinary. The extraordinary versus the ordinary. The Apostle Paul was writing, and in Acts 19, if you've got your Bibles, you want to follow along with me, I'm going to take you to verse chapter 11. And it starts off and it says this in verse chapter 11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. That's the extraordinary. How many of you are in this place today because of an extraordinary miracle of the hand of God? I've been saved, signed, sealed, and delivered. I've been delivered of drugs. I've been delivered of alcohol. I've been delivered from sex. I've been delivered from hate. I've been delivered from from greed, whatever it may be. The grace of God has come in my life. He has cleaned me up. I no longer have, have those addictions. I no longer have those desires. I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. That old thing is gone, and I am a new man. And the Apostle Paul is experiencing this, and it says that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul in the church that he was working at in this place. Place. Even so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that he touched, that had touched him, were taken to the sick, and they would lay these on the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Woo! That is what you call walking in the Holy Spirit. That is what you call walking in the faith of how big my God is. Cloth that he touched became anointed. (laughs) I want to walk in some of that. I want to experience some of that. The extraordinary is taking place, and all of a sudden the ordinary over here goes, oh, wait a minute. So there were some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, over those who were (laughs) demon-possessed. The extraordinary is taking place, and God is doing some incredible things. And then the ordinary goes, oh, but I want to act like that. How many Christians are living in ordinary lives when you could live an extraordinary life? Oh, I want to be like God, but I sure don't want to pay the price. I want to, I want to live like Jesus, but I sure don't want to pay the price. And they were saying this, in the name of <laughs> the Jesus, <laughs> not in the name of my Jesus. They had, they had no clue what a personal relationship was with God. But they said, hey, in the name of the Jesus who Paul preaches, I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. Now, in verse 14, it says that there were seven sons of Sceva. 
this Jewish guy had seven sons that I guess this is how they made their living. They would go around casting out demons and praying over people and doing all this stuff. And it was an ordinary little ministry that they had, not the extraordinary that Paul was doing. And they were going around doing this stuff. And it says the seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, um, uh, were doing this. And one day the evil spirit answered them. <laughs> Run for the river. <laughs> when, that spirit, when that evil spirit speaks up an answer, you better pay attention. And they were praying in the name of Jesus, you've got to come out. And that evil spirit spoke up and said, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Why, this Jesus I know. I don't know how an evil spirit, this Jesus I know. <laughs> I don't know. This Jesus I know, <laughs> and I know Paul, but who are you? Who are you? They had no clue who Jesus was, but other than that, they didn't know the trickery of their enemy. Come on. And they said in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Jesus that Paul's preaching, come out. And that evil spirit said, Jesus I know. <laughs> I know the power of who Jesus is because he kicked my butt on the cross. And I know who Paul is because, man, he's doing some extraordinary things and God is working in him miraculously. This evil spirit says, but who are you? That evil spirit turned on them, took all seven of those guys and did a beating on them and stripped their clothes off of them. And the word of God says that evil spirit sent them running out of that house. Guess what? Naked and afraid. Because they had no clue what the authority of the name of Jesus Christ brings. I told you I was closing with that, and I'm closing with this. That was my first closing. You closed at 1130. Shame on you. No. <laughs> You did good, man. You did good. You had, what, 30 minutes to prepare? You did good. But that, that spirit jumped on them and sent them running out of the house naked and afraid. Next week as we come in, we're going to talk about naked and afraid. And we're going to talk about how to put on the full armor of God so you don't have to fight, fight and naked. You don't have to fight afraid. You can walk in with the boldness and be clothed in the armor that God, God's got for you because there is a battle that's not coming. There is a battle that is already raging all around us. It is a battle that is, is raging and God says, you don't have to fight for the victory. I've already won it on Calvary. I just need you to fight from the victory that I already won for you. And I'm going to teach you how to clothe yourself so that you can walk in the very presence of who I am, so you can walk in the very power of who I am. My prayer is this, that we have so much Jesus in us that it is nothing ordinary, that we are operating in the extraordinary, that the very presence of us walking in this place, people are being healed in the name of Jesus, that marriages are being restored by the power of God, that I just pray that our clothes become so holy that as people touch our garments, like that lady that had the issue of blood, that the power of God flows through and people People's lives are miraculously changed. We've got to clothe ourselves in the armor of God. Stand with me. Father, we love you and we praise your wonderful name. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that as we dive into this study, it'll be the biggest eye opener in the world of what you have for us to be successful. It'll be the biggest eye opener that, that we can walk through this unsinged in the name of Jesus. That we do not have to operate in the ordinary, but we can operate in the extraordinary because you are a big God. You're a big God. As every head's bowed, nobody looking around. If you're here today, you do not know Jesus. I want to pray that you'll invite him into your life today. And I'm not going to embarrass you, call you out, but if you're here and you just want to invite Jesus into your life, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and we're just going to pray for you. Just pray for you. Everybody good today? Father, we love you. You are incredible. And we give you all the praise, we give you all the glory, and we give you all the honor. And Father, I'm going to pray that as we leave today, understanding that this is life at war, I'm going to pray that as we dive into the Word of God, that you will encourage us like none other, that we can overcome an enemy who comes to deceive us. We're going to be victorious in the name of Jesus. So I pray as we leave this place today, birth with this a hunger to know more about what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Ephesians. 
Father, I pray for a good day. I pray for rain that soaks into the ground. I pray for the blessings of God to be poured out upon each and every one of us. I pray that you'll just send us favor before us. Bless us in the name of Jesus. Put a smile on our face and a skip on our step, and we're going to be careful always to give you all the praise and the glory. Hey, hug someone's face. Kiss their neck. <laughs> give them a great big hug and tell them how much you love them. And we'll see you back here Wednesday night or Sunday at church. God bless. Have a fantastic week.